Hello everyone and welcome to the EVN Disrupt podcast. My name is Nejda Tsaturyan and I'm the editor of the creative tech section here at EVN Report. My guest today is Ashot Vartanyan, the founder and CEO of Unum. Unum is a deep tech company focused on designing next generation AI models and cutting edge database technologies. We discussed Ashot's unorthodox journey towards building an AI company and the work he and the team are doing at Unum. Thank you for listening. Ashot, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Ashot, I want to start with your background because I know your story is fascinating. Um, tell me how you got into computer science and, and engineering. Um, well, it depends on how much time we have here. We have uh, a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was quite lucky uh, in a sense that I grew up in the environment where uh, like academic accomplishments were really desirable to many people and like i was nurtured in an environment where i could study from early age so uh, i grew up in russia and in my school in elementary school we had informatics uh, from second grade so this dates back to 2003. a couple of days ago when i realized it's like 2023 now i got shocked a bit because it's going to be like 20 years this year that i'm coding right what were you learning back then Pascal. I think in the very beginning, uh, we had those like very simple, uh, like semi visual programming languages, like almost no code. Uh, But I was a bit of a a social outcast in the early ages. So uh, I stayed for a long time after classes, uh, talking to my teachers. And uh, oftentimes they would let me study with older peers. So if there was like a guy who's maybe like five, 10 years older than I am, and he's doing some programming, the teacher would be kind enough to give the same puzzles as she was giving to them, to me simultaneously. So on one side, I didn't want to go home too much and uh, I didn't have too many friends. On the other side, there was this teacher who would give me all the cool puzzles. So it got me deeper and deeper into programming mm-hmm. and uh, over time with basic Pascal and many other languages. Yeah, very cool. Um, do you remember the first program you wrote from start to end? No, yeah. no way. Yeah. <laughs> I remember like the gradual steps. Uh, so in the very beginning, uh, those were like trivial, uh, trivial questions, maybe a somewhat simpler version of what people try to solve during different ICPC uh, competitions. So just uh, Olympiad-like questions and puzzles, like you have a matrix, how you organize the data in it, or how like do you shuffle or like uh, yeah. rearrange it. And then over time, I got my first friend who was a bit older than I am and from a wealthy family. So he had all the cool toys. Uh, He also lived really close to us. So every evening I would go to his parents' apartment. We would sit together in his bedroom and we would uh, design all kinds of different stuff. So like uh, we would assemble drones. Uh, we would program code uh, in the middle school. I started doing uh, freelancing and web development and also web design. And me and my friend, we were doing all kinds of crazy projects you would never think a kid would do. And to give you a perspective of how like absurd they were, uh, at one point we were making like an exchange platform for construction materials. Oh, wow. And like you have two kids, 11, 12 years old somewhere, like, well, not in a basement, but in an apartment uh, oh. <laughs> in St. Petersburg, Russia, and they are doing the last thing you would expect kids to do. Right, yeah. Did you guys launch that uh, that exchange? Probably, yes. Uh, it definitely had no commercial value right. or uh, success in it. Luckily, we've made a few mistakes here and there, but then... The projects that I started doing after that myself, they became somewhat successful. Right. So this is all during your school years, like up to high school and stuff. Yes. Um, And during high school, those projects that you talk about that later on did become successful, did they start in high school for you or did you, was it during your university years or post school? No, it was actually in high school. So I kind of date everything with some technological milestones because it's oftentimes hard to go back this many years. So now when I try to date, when I was doing a specific application or something like this, I was just trying to remember what kind of node, a laptop I was using back <laughs> then or what was my phone or something like that. And I remember that in years like 2007 and eight, I was a struggling freelance web developer. Uh, I would have to make maybe 10 times more portfolio projects than I had orders just to fill up uh, my portfolio with something. 
And then once I finally got some orders, I saved all the money instead of spending it on different toys. And two years later, uh, of not spending a dime, I finally uh, bought myself my first personal computer, not family's computer. Right. <laughs> the one that I don't have to share with my brother. The one that I don't have to share with my parents when they want to uh, read the news in the evening or like check out what's happening in Armenia or something like that. What computer was that? Uh, the first one I bought for myself was uh, a MacBook, which was ridiculous, to be honest, because uh, uh, looking back at myself back then, I was not really confident that like Mac is the technology I want or like uh, Apple is the kind of brand that would uh, resonate with me. But then I had this little brother who always loved fancy things. And somehow he convinced me that uh, if I'm buying something, it must be a MacBook. And right. it was the first <laughs> aluminum body MacBook Pro in 2009. So this puts it like two and a half, three years before finishing high school. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I bought that one, I installed Xcode. Uh, it was the years of iOS 4. And now we have like iOS 16 and 17, I guess is coming soon. So back then the App Store was empty. And no matter what kind of garbage you did, <laughs> you could have sold it uh, at a good price because there was very little competition. Hopefully, the stuff that I was making wasn't that bad. I actually saw people using it and enjoying it. So this kind of gives me right. hope that uh, even back then it was solid tech. Right. So after the freelancing, you moved on to mobile app development and selling stuff on the App Store? Yes, exactly. What were you, what were you building? Uh, so I started with educational apps. As I told you, uh, like um, a lot of my friends, they were either older or they were just my teachers. And I always had this fascination with like science and uh, fundamental things. And when I was in school, I was participating in Olympiads in almost all subjects, uh, just representing my school, not successfully. Uh, not that not, It's not like I was winning medals here and there. I was just very curious. And when I was doing that, I realized that many of the kids, they may have learned something or maybe more than they did if they had better tools. So I focused on educational technology. I knew that I would have uh, our analog of SAT exams. So like Rush also has a standardized exam system these days. Uh, I've prepared apps for like six, seven or eight subjects, all with the curriculum that I've assembled myself with tests and puzzles that I've assembled myself. Uh, and also the apps, they were built by me, designed by me, like end-to-end -end indie developer experience. Right, yeah. Were you interested in entrepreneurship from a young age? Like, were you building businesses around these products because you really loved to, because you really wanted to? Or did you just want a way to, to make to make money on the side to, for some other reason? You know, like this word, entrepreneur, uh, it kind of never attracted me by itself. So it just so happened that my family was struggling when I was a little boy. Uh, we didn't have much money and I love technology. And for me, I just naturally started earning money by building stuff. So even before I started programming in my second year in school, I would convince my nanny uh, to walk with me to the nearby electronics shop. And I was uh, a frequent user of all kinds of torrents, uh, pirate bays and uh, whatever else exists. Mm. So. I guess it's not a very good sh thing to share in the podcast, but we all did something uh, when we were kids. We were all on LimeWire back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> so I would collect a lot of interesting data from the internet, including like uh, pirate content and music and videos. I would burn uh, CDs and DVDs and sell to kids who were fa first graders, like from wealthier families. Right. So is it entrepreneurship? I don't think so. Well, it's some form of earning money, maybe some form of business. But then over time, the projects became more complex. They required some more strategy. So it kind of naturally became what most people, I guess, consider entrepreneurship. Yeah. But I think that's like, that's the typical entrepreneur story. I mean, like if, when you when you look at the, the really successful names these days, they all had some of some sort of this like small little side gig when they were kids in school and stuff like um, well, maybe. You know, <laughs> selling phone cases or something. Or well, like, that I did as well. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> I remember at the time, like you could get like 10 cent uh, phone cases on eBay from China yes. and they would take like a, a month to 
to come to exactly. Canada. But then you would sell them for like five dollars at school, and I mean that's a great return on your profit. Of course, <laughs> it happened the, yeah. exactly the same thing. It happened to me. Like yeah. you would, go, I would go to the postal office, and I was very very short until I graduated from high school. So uh, like in my family, man, kind of grow really late. <laughs> uh, so when I was like finishing high school, I looked like I'm ten. And imagine like the, the postal office, a kid that looks like his tan coming and receiving packages from China on a regular basis. Right, right. That r- looked really <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> okay, so so you you were doing these projects in high school. Then what did you end up doing after high school? You went to university. Uh, yes. So at that time, I wasn't hundred percent sure what kind of academic path uh, would be in front of me. And as I've mentioned, some of the kids were older, so I asked them, "What do they study in the university?" So the guys who studied in uh, like computer science departments and informatics departments, especially the ones who had done some programming before finishing high school, uh, they kind of uh, were reluctant to uh, advise me to go there, and uh, they suggested me look somewhere else. And then I turned to my teachers. I've asked them, "What's the most complex thing uh, they think I can study? Like, what is the most challenging problem?" And in my city, we had like three really uh, fundamental departments focused like on theoretical subjects. One is pure maths, another one is like theoretical and applied physics, and the third one was computer science. Computer science was uh, skipped like due to previous reviews, <laughs> and uh, the pure mathematics department was interesting, but I didn't think that's my path. So I continued into uh, first general and theoretical physics and then forking into astrophysics. Uh, so you started studying astrophysics and were you still programming your projects on the side? Yes, all the time. So yeah. I, I, am, uh, I tried to go deep into technology, but I guess sometimes I had to just accept the fact that I'm somewhat a, general, a generalist. Uh, so kind of breadth uh, first stuff comes easier than depth first to me. So... I would not just study in my department, I would simultaneously study in a few places and no one would know about it. Yeah. But I would fail everywhere and uh, it kind of uh, worsened my reputation a little bit among teachers because they thought I'm not just I'm just not investing time into You're what not they focused. Yeah. yeah. But, but I loved uh, studying everything. So I was lucky that when I was finishing high school, uh, online platforms like MIT OpenCourseWare, which is still alive, uh, had appeared. EdX appeared as like a joint platform between Harvard and MIT as well. And uh, over the years, other platforms like uh, Coursera appeared, uh, lectures from top uh, professors started being uploaded to uh, to YouTube. And I was just like trying to sync everything uh, in. I would go to printing stores and going back to my like uh, life uh, in elementary school and walking around torrents and pirate bays and so on. Back then, the internet was very accessible in a sense that there were no corners that you couldn't get your hands into. So I guess I have to admit that over the years, I've been crawling the FTP servers of the top universities. Yeah. So I had access to the preprints of their courses before they published them. Right. So uh, a lot of the courses that I would later print in St. Petersburg, Russia, were courses like in English or like manuscripts of upcoming books, oftentimes like 400, 500 pages. Uh, now all of it is just collecting dust in my bedroom in Russia. Right. But back then, uh, teachers in my university would oftentimes see me with unexpectedly wide manuscripts containing subjects different than the ones that are they are teaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So failing everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask this question now, but you know, it was interesting t- to me to hear you describe yourself as a generalist because... You and I have had, we've had technical conversations before, and I think anyone who has had those kinds of conversations with you will say that you're like a real engineer's engineer, (laughs) like hardcore. (laughs) (laughs) And one of the things that I'm, I'm always interested in when I'm, when I meet people like you who have then gone into entrepreneurship or building startups is, do you get to do what you really always loved? Like, cause I mean, as a CEO of a company, you have a lot of hats to wear, you're managing people, you're raising money, you're selling the product. But you're first and foremost, I think, an engineer. Like, what's that transition like? Do you miss the just being an engineer part? I 100% miss parts of it. But I think there are some qualities that really make up good engineers. And it's like a certain form of patience when you can spend like weeks or months working on a single problem 
And whenever I look back on my career, there has been those like long runs when I'm not accomplishing anything. And like within those three months, it's only one week of ing uh, like of programming out of uh, 12 weeks that actually gives me joy. The remaining 11 weeks is like something like solving bugs or right. fixing stuff. And you have to go through those things. And now, even though I'm not uh, like programming as much as I want to, I still get those maybe like seven days of luck within every season. And uh, I cherish them. And the rest of the time, yes, uh, maybe I'm not solving bugs that often anymore because now I have a team and my teammates are kind enough to help me with those things. Yeah. Uh, and the rest of the time I can uh, devote to f forming international uh, collaboration uh, between our company and others, spreading the word about the technology, planning strategy, raising money, everything you've mentioned. Right. How much code do you get to write these days? Uh, well, uh, not to give just like a random number, but to give more context to people. Over the years, I've seen people uh, claiming different numbers, like how much they work and what it means to be like an effective engineer. I think it really depends on what kind of engineering you're doing and the kind of programming languages that you use. So they differ significantly in their expressivity. And it's not just like about the number of lines of code, it's the number of symbols per line, everything, the number of like punctuation uh, involved. So when I was a little kid uh, and a little later in high school, when I was doing programming for mobile apps, I would write just an astonishing amount of code. So I would easily write 3,000 lines of code a day. Wow. And uh, later, this would give me an advantage because you learn to work with really large code bases. But it's also very different from writing, let's say, 3,000 lines of assembly code. Right. So Objective-C is like a language in which you describe interfaces. Those are notoriously verbose. The same amount of work in another language in another domain, not for visual stuff, could have been, let's say, 10 times shorter. Now, sometimes I can spend, let's say, even a week working on just like three lines of code. And this uh, kind of covers the two absolute extremes. So I guess most developers are somewhere in the logarithmical middle. And I'm generally either on one end writing a lot and building up uh, prototypes of entire services within a matter of like a week. Uh, even now as a CEO. Even now as a CEO. Uh, but sometimes I would st like go really deep into like assembly level optimizations and we buy a lot of hardware to be able like to tune those nanoseconds, like squeeze them out of every inch of hardware. And then, yes, it's seven weeks for two lines of code. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so before we get to Unum and, and dive deep into the products you guys are building, how did you become this level of a computer science expert? Because you said you were studying physics. So yeah. what's the track there? Um, so... This is this may sound a bit weird to uh, most people listening in Armenia cuz I know that uh, educational institutions here do not really teach this much code. So it was like a stark contrast when I moved here cuz I just mentioned in my school I was doing it from the second grade and people who come here to the university to study computer science oftentimes haven't had like programming experience until the age of 17 not age 7. And then it gets worse because I've heard from a guy originally, like in 2020 when I moved here, that kids can go through university without writing a thousand lines of code. And if, uh, let's say, I was writing 3,000 a day at age 15, then definitely, yeah, I'm not saying it was high quality, but oftentimes quantity transforms sure. into quality. Especially so. if it's that much quantity. Yes, yeah. exactly. So... Then I got into physics, and you would think physicists wouldn't study any programming. So I must have studied something completely different. But luckily for me, the curriculum uh, in my program was structured in such a way that on the first year of university, uh, we were studying C, C++, and Fortran, even though the lang uh, most of those languages I, I already knew and used for production services, so I actually didn't have to study them. And on the second year of our university, we would study Python and MATLAB. So this covers five programming languages with intense schedule over the course of two years. And it contains some rigorous tests. Like it wasn't that easy to pass for people who didn't have programming experience before. So on one side, even if I didn't have programming experience before university and just would have studied there, I want to know that I could have learned programming. But the more important thing so here I should put an asterisk and maybe say it explicitly. Even if you are late to programming, it doesn't make, it doesn't mean you cannot get 
good at it. And our universities, even the ones that teach physics, could have easily extended their curriculum to include more applied skills such as programming, because most of the science is computational these days anyways. Right. The second part I want to mention is that I always uh, thought that like this university, especially the community in which I was studying, it's such a great place to nurture talent. I was surrounded by extremely talented kids from all over Russia and CIS. I was the only person from my own city. Everyone else were like mostly Olympiad winners from all around the country, exceptionally talented kids, pure joy to work with them, to solve puzzles together and listen to our teachers. And I thought, if I finish this university, this, w this is what would make me a scientist. But I couldn't be more wrong. When I actually left the university, I dropped my degree uh, after four years. I actually dropped it twice. So the first time I just uh, wasn't successful enough and like I, I, I was thrown away. The second time I left myself because I had some achievements in theoretical computer science that I had to pursue. But when I left the university, I started reading like obsessively and not even like a paper a day which is already a lot compared to what you are generally exposed to in a university. So in, in the university, even if you are doing like a PhD program, you would generally have like maybe a couple of uh, paper reviews during a week. But then when I started building this company, I thought uh, with my like childish ambitions and maximalism that we want to be the best in everything. So I have to know all the state of the art across multiple domains and sometimes I would read like three papers a day, which accumulates into like a, a thousand papers a year. And simultaneously, I would attend like all kinds of meetups I could. So I started traveling a lot and got myself into the places where community was always eager to study something new. And I would expose myself to this. And even though now it's impossible to believe it, but in the beginning I had an imposter syndrome, not thinking that I may know anything because like I don't have the background. I come from a place... Uh, which doesn't really have like a high rating or something. None of my parents are scientists. Why would anyone be interested to know what I'm doing? Right. But then over the years, kind of the... Uh, it goes uh, away. Yeah, yeah, it goes the away. The imposter exactly. system goes away, yeah. I mean, you have a research paper in front of you right now. Those <laughs> the, that's the first author of which I think never went to college. So, you know, that well, yeah. <laughs> puts it into context. <laughs> so during this whole time, you're, you're traveling, you're going, you're exposing yourself to the scientific ecosystem of the world, really. And in ways, you're kind of mimicking the ideal scientific education, I guess you could say. How were you financing all this through your side projects and stuff? Like That's a really good question. So uh, the last years in the university, aside from all the theoretical research I was doing uh, mostly in, well, in physics, in bioinformatics, and also like pure theoretical computer science and AI research, uh, the latter would later become UNUM. I also still continued building iOS applications for a later, like for more mature versions of iOS, like iOS 6 and 7. The process wasn't as successful as in the beginning. So even if you are up to a good start, it doesn't mean like that every single uh, following project will be equally successful. True. And at some point, my parents, my mother convinced me that I should also start taking side projects, like essentially freelance jobs, uh, freelance jobs for like iOS development. It went even worse because like when you have true passion for something such as like science and fundamental research, and even my notepad had like a hundred application ideas that I would build for myself rather than working on somebody else's project, forcing yourself to work on something that you don't feel passion for will never yield you the same results. That's why it's so important to find whatever you love in life, because otherwise you will not be ever good at it. Then some of like those projects that I was doing for others kind of failed as well, but I was never forced to work on them. So I had some savings, as I told you, like I had never had- A lavish uh, lifestyle. Uh, lavish yeah. lifestyle like buying myself cars, apartments, and I could spend everything just on normal lifestyle, but stretch it over the years. So that's what I did. And now when I look back at it, I realize that a lot more people have actually the potential to replicate this kind of lifestyle that I had without actually like having too much money. So when I started building Unum, I left St. Petersburg to move to Moscow, then from Moscow to Dubai, from Dubai to Beijing, then to Hong Kong, and then for a year, I lived in Asia, for a year in Europe, a year in South America, and a year in North America. I've lived and visited all major cities that uh, a little uh, kid from St. Petersburg may hope to visit. 
And especially in the beginning, I was only spending maybe like fifteen hundred dollars a month, or like、uh, maybe well less than two thousand. That was like my budget. And if you look at software developer salaries today, they are significantly higher than this. Even the ones that we pay in Armenia and like in our teams are significantly higher than those salaries、uh, than those budgets. And with this amount of money, if you do good planning, you can achieve just exceptionally high quality of life.、Uh, to be honest, much higher than what、uh, is available in Yerevan. For example, when I was living, I just had a call with a guy from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, so Malaysia. I've also lived in Kuala Lumpur for a while. How、uh, many cities have you lived in? Do you know? Over a dozen, and I've so I've been to over a hundred cities、wow. of, in over fifty countries, and I've lived in maybe ten countries out of those. Okay.、Uh, and when I say lived, I mean a prolonged period of time of at least a month when I would rent an apartment. Uh, buy myself groceries, get to know the community, potentially start learning the local language, like、uh, really dive into what's around me. So I've lived in Kuala Lumpur for about like two or three months. I've been there many times as well. When I was living there, I was living on the fifty-fifth floor of one of the tallest residential buildings on the planet, with just stunning view out of my window. And I would spend significantly less on my apartment with an included outdoor swimming pool and gym. Then I spend in Yerevan for a significantly smaller and simpler apartment. Yeah, especially these days. <laughs> especially these days with the high demand we have. Yes.、Yeah. And you know, when you were doing this, remote work and remote culture wasn't what it is today. I mean, today somebody could have like a a six figure job in、yeah. California that's fully remote. Yeah. And live in you know almost anywhere in the world. From exactly. Where where the cost of living is way way less. So you're right that people could definitely do it. So when you were okay, so you're hopping around from city to city, country to country, and all day you're just coding, working on your your own science scientific research pro- projects and stuff, or and doing and going to meetups. Kind of yes. So、uh, I would just clarify that I would split those two procedures. It was like an experiment life. Experiment I did over my life. And、uh, how long are we talking? Like seven years, six years? So this traveling period of my life was like four or five years. Okay.、Uh, so I'm building Uno for seven years and about three months now. Out of those, the first five years I worked on it alone, and I was mostly traveling. And then I assembled the team in Armenia, and、uh, I settled here. And now I do much less traveling. I work more direct with the people、uh, around me. So the part that I was、uh, that I wanted to clarify is that. I only had a backpack with me,、uh, one backpack worth of my stuff. One third of it was my laptops. One third of it was my GPU, like a graphics processing unit. You needed like to do like AI experiments and this kind of stuff. And one third of it was just like、uh, the bare minimum of clothes. So like a couple of shorts、yeah. and a couple of t-shirts. And when you kind of limit your life to only the most essentials, you kind of obstruct yourself away from everything else that's happening, and you can really think about like your strategy in life. So let's say I'm spending a year on a specific continent, like Asia. I could、uh, split it in such a way that I spend maybe half a year somewhere on a remote island, just on a beach, reading papers all day and coding. Not very good for the laptop because the sun gets in, but still I was doing it. And then during these periods of time, I may even like limit myself from talking to other people. So like I know people do a lot of different、like、spiritual practices and meditation.、Uh, I'm not really a specialist on those, and like coming from purely academic background, I'm not always I'm not I don't always understand those, especially like the spiritual formalism that's behind them. But there is like certain kind of thinking that best happens when you are fully isolated from everything else, like we, when you do not engage into social interactions and this kind of stuff. So I could spend like half a year just not talking to anyone and working on crazy stuff that only I know in a code base that only I have ever seen. Right.、Uh, that is like millions of lines of code, and it would want even compile. So like you cannot even test if your ideas are working. I would just like assemble complex abstractions over and over until I thought、uh, found like good architecture, and then for another half a year I would go to other places. Where I would have almost nothing but social interactions. So you're talking 24/7、uh, in a place like Singapore and Hong Kong, like in the case of Asia, attending all kinds of meetups and forming your network、uh, of other specialists and connections. 
this would become more and more pronounced as I went from east to west because the culture is more uh, kind of targeted for those kinds of active social interactions, networking active networking. Culture, yeah. Exactly. So when I was in SF, uh, San Francisco, I would go like to two or three meetups a day. Uh, and by the way, like if you ever plan to go there, this is like a really good uh, way to save money because the apartment's costs are, costs are really high. Uh, so if you're paying a rent, you don't want to spend too much money on food. And all the good meetups have great snacks. Right. <laughs> so by attending them like three times a day, I had three proper meals and I could just uh, save tip. the rest. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, and I have to warn that uh, with a $2,000 budget in San Francisco, it's really hard. So by that time, yeah. I've actually increased my budget. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I started actually making some profits, so it helped. That's good. Yeah. So uh, in there, I started networking more, and this is what kind of lifestyle yeah. I had. It's, it's such a fascinating experience, and I, I hope to like read your book one day when you, <laughs> you publish it. I have so many questions, but I've got to ask about the GPU. You said you're carrying around a GPU in your yes. backpack. Was it like an eGPU that you would plug into your... Exactly. Okay. eGPU stands for the external GPU, right. and it was a Titan Volta. Uh, so it's like a very beefy $4,000 GPU yeah. that I've plugged out of my uh, desktop workstation in yeah. Russia, and I've carried it all around the planet. <laughs> and you cannot imagine like how many complex interactions on customs and passing security in the airport yeah. I had because of this GPU. Like... <laughs> try explaining to them what it yeah, does that's fascinating i'm curious how much this has influenced your your way of thinking and your methodology like you know the type of work you do which we'll get to in a second is you know real like deep tech work that often people with phds and stuff are doing you you i mean you might not have those letters after your name but you recreated that experience for yourself and you really took it down to a like a fundamentalist approach of you know of like first principles, like what does it mean to be a scientist? Okay, you need to know these things, you need to have these experiences, you need to have this way of thinking and stuff. And you recreated that for yourself. Is that something that's sort of like, that's sort of baked into your way of thinking about just things in life? Like, is, do you look at things from a first principles perspective often? 100%, but I don't know which one of this is the cause and which one is like the outcome. Uh, like maybe so, you were that way before. Yeah, so... When I was a little kid, I was doing reading obsessively and I would challenge almost every single idea I see in a book or every single norm uh, accepted by society. It's really a bad way to make friends because like, you disagree uh, with people on almost everything, but then you learn to defend really complex ideas yeah. uh, and maybe suggest alternatives to the status quo. Fascinating. Okay, let's get to Unum. Um, tell, me about, uh, tell me about what you guys are doing. This is your startup. Um, well, uh, so the problem is to be a good entrepreneur or a startup founder, you have to be able to explain in plain words what your company does. Exactly. And I never can do that. So I'm a horrible entrepreneur. We'll uh, work on it today. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend uh, whose name is also Ashad. Uh, he best describes our work as uh, they do crazy shit. Uh I tend to think that this about sums up, uh, sums up our experience. So in reality, uh, when I left the university and left physics, I thought I should devote myself to something equally big and important as fundamental studies of nature, but maybe better aligned with my skills where I can give the world more value. So I will never be the next Einstein and I will not never like push physics as much as it was pushed in the 20th century, but maybe I can do something in the industry that is closer to my natural skills. So I thought that the biggest challenge I can take on is artificial intelligence and uh, growing it as far as it can go. So I decided I will devote the next 30 to 40 years of my life on working on this issue. And along this path, uh, it was obvious to me, even in my school years, let alone after university, that when you try to work on really large ideas, it's very hard to depend on external funding. So I, th I saw researchers struggling to push really good ideas forward because they depended on some other external resource. Uh, so I thought I need some form of like a financial foundation for this, a really good way to ensure this uh, influx of money into proper research is to build a company around it, a really deep, deeply technical company that will look into artificial intelligence from fundamental standpoints 
and would disassemble everything that we need to actually grow AI over the decades into not just designing new neural networks or new architectures or like new training pipelines, but actually rebuilding the whole data processing pipeline. And when you look like onto those layers of abstractions that were growing since like the 60s and the 70s and 80s of the previous century. Yes, the foundations were laid by exceptionally talented people, like the first people in computing, like Russell and Turing. They were laid by people, the first people in AI, like Marvin Minsky, all bright people. But this is a very evolutionary approach and it leads to evolutionary changes. That's, that may not be bad, but it's somewhat slow. And is everything in science, it's a race. Like you want to get somewhere first. So to have like a revolutionary approach, you have to go back and look like from a side as how this evolution happened. Like you disassemble, almost like when you look at the DNA, you see like pieces that have uh, like that are closer to like more ancient species and the ones that are like more modern, same way with a mammalian brain. Like it has newer parts of it and it has older parts of it. Same way here, even in artificial intelligence and in computing, there are so many ideas that may have seemed good at the time, but now they serve as the foundation for something far more complex. What if we go back and replace those? Maybe our path towards AI then will be cut short by a factor of two, maybe, like maybe even just by a constant number, like a couple of years. It still would matter a lot. Right. Yeah. Okay. But what's the like core product you guys have <laughs> So you see, I'm learning to talk like a politician, yeah. like uh, going around the yeah. question, never answering it. Uh, so at this point, seven years in, almost until now, we had no products. So for seven years, we were just doing research, building up a very complex project. And it is actually like so complex that generally only big tech companies invest into this. That's why I call Unum the smallest big tech company. Right. <laughs> uh, so uh, to give you a perspective, we have like three products that we're unveiling right now. The first one is called Unistore. It's our universal way of storing the data. The second one is Unisearch. Is our family of algorithms that we use to actually navigate this big data sets. And the third one is Uniform. It's a set of neural networks that help us learn shared representations between objects that originate in different domains. And this actually plays well into our longer term ambitions in AI, but I, I guess I don't want to go this path because it will take another four hours to discuss. <laughs> so uh, those three products, they hope to be the best in industry, the best in class by their own. But once you assemble them together, the uh, gained value that we can bring to customers is nothing like what they can experience today. But to be honest, even those projects separately are mind boggling. I, I can give you a reference. So Armenia is going through a big transition right now. We have a lot of product companies, a lot of AI oriented companies. It really warms my heart to see the progress of my peers, other founders, other engineers and researchers. I love seeing their products uh, evolve. Sometimes I use them uh, personally. Most of them though are product companies. So they actually interact with the end customer, with a, with a human. In our case, what we build is infrastructure. It lays behind the product companies or beneath them. So we can be the foundation of dozens or hundreds or millions of businesses whom we can give a better ability to process the data more efficiently. So let's focus on like storage component because it's like the biggest thing that we are doing right now. It's the foundation of everything else. And for reference, many of the modern tech giants have started as database companies and later evolved into cloud providers. That's why our domain name is unum.cloud. Our ambitions are very obvious. So uh, for reference, companies like Oracle and SAP being the enterprise cloud provider in the US and Europe respectively, they've started as database companies. Now, uh, both of them are in hundreds of billions of dollars, easily dwarfing numerous other businesses and being superior in their company size and their power to entire nations, mm -hmm. uh, let alone smaller nations like Armenia. So what we're trying to build is like such a behemoth of a company, but from very small, humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we have a tiny team of uh, uh, like a dozen and a half engineers. And this storage engine that we've built, it will revolutionize the way how databases are constructed. 
it so happened that databases, uh, most of them have relational uh, nature, and that concept was uh, uh, popularized in 80s. And many even modern databases kind of live on the same principles that are over 40 years old. And if the core idea is 40 years old, I would say the implementation quality is at least 20 years old. So this is a very viscous technology. It takes a lot of time to replace it. But once you do, it stays for decades. Mm -hmm. So in the last couple of years, a, a significant change in the industry started happening. So new database companies started popping up. It just so happened that I was lucky enough to be an investor in almost all of our competing companies that went public. So when I was living in Silicon Valley, I would be sometimes one of the beneficiaries of the companies. Uh, that have participated in financially. This would include companies like MongoDB, Elasticsearch, and Snowflake. Those companies are, at this point, when the market is a bit down, uh, I'm not really following their uh, quotes, but at the end of the previous year, uh, their market caps were 35, 15, and $120 billion, respectively. The latter is uh, 40 times the government budget of Armenia for that same year. Right. Uh, so essentially, this company has uh, as much value in it as 40 years of a development of an entire country, yeah. which kind of really puts a perspective on how hard it is to build this kind of technology. One thing that all those three companies and about 20 other rising database stars share is that even at $100 billion value, they rarely replace the underlying piece, which is a database engine. It's essentially, for those with a computer science and programming background, this is an associative container that is oftentimes placed in persistent memory. So essentially like a dictionary of elements that you put on disk, on SSD, or something like that. So those pieces, they do not grow on the trees. Like You cannot just like find them everywhere. There are only two or three implementations that every database company uses, and two of them are maintained by Google and Facebook, or Alphabet and Meta. Right. None, uh, so even $100 billion companies rarely go as far as to replace those technologies. Generally, they just build on those. Right. And trillion-dollar companies generally like build those technologies. So this technology, a database engine or a key value store, we've spent a few years building it. We're now 100% certain that this is by far, uh, by a factor of five to seven at least, the fastest key value store ever built. Wow. And uh, more than that, the technological uh, advances that we've put into it, we are quite certain that it will take a long period of time for competitors to actually gain anything like this because it reformulates the whole design. It's really hard to retrofit into an existing system, so you have to rebuild it from scratch. So with this in mind, we're now trying to popularize this technology. Can you tell our listeners in a kind of like non-technical friendly way uh, what the key architectural differences are between your database technology and the classical ones? Uh, okay, so... This is a test on your entrepreneurial skills. <laughs> uh, so if we talk just about the storage engine, the, the coolest core technology... Let's first start with a metaphor. So when you buy a car, there's a car and there's a car engine. Sometimes the manufacturers are different. So companies like Rolls-Royce uh, or Bentley, they will not be manufacturing uh, car engines oftentimes. People who buy, let's say, a Mercedes, an Audi, or like a, a Rolls-Royce and a BMW will oftentimes have the same engine but different interior. So even though you're using different databases or different cars, the engine may be shared. And because of this, like very high-end Rolls Royces and BMWs have similar speeds, similar uh, acceleration metrics, and this kind of stuff. So if we just talk about the engine that we've designed, some of the interesting ideas that we've put in, I would call them kernel bypass. So what happens is when you boot up a computer, there's an operating system like Windows or Linux or Macintosh. It controls all the devices within the computer. And it talks to the disk, It know, and there's like a file system. So when you create your documents, it puts them into folders, it assembles them on the disk and something like this. So what we've done, we've actually removed the operating system out of this equation. So our database actually knows how to organize the data on disk much better than the operating system itself. So we kind of throw the operating system out of the equation. We say, 
we good for now. Thank you very much, Macintosh, for doing all the great things you do. But from now on, we are managing the disks and we know how to do it. And because of the ways how we like organize these operations with the disk, we are capable of gaining those five to seven X performance improvements. Right. And this is a strictly a B2B product right now? You guys are selling yes, to businesses? Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, the second product you guys said that you you guys are working on was, um, I guess, like a family of APIs for uh, AI models. Talk to us a little bit about that. So today uh, with DALI, ChatGPT, MidJourney, AI, especially generative AI, is like everywhere in the news. I've had a few lectures about it over the course of the last year. And before that, it's been maybe like only five or like five or six years since the last time I've given lectures on AI, mostly in the Bay Area on the stuff like graph neural networks. Back then, there was no such name as graph neural networks. So we're just like discussing concepts like right. on of machine learning on graphs uh, with like backpropagation and gradient descent. Today, our AI team is working on again, an engine component that in many ways can drive many of those even generative models. So what would a generative model, for example, do? Today, many of those networks, neural networks, learn to draw. So you type in a text query, and this text query is transformed into the visual representation of it. So you type something like Paris at night, and what you see is either a photographic or artistic representation of Paris at night. For this to happen, you actually need an intermediate conversion layer when you know that certain images are semantically, or in terms of meaning, similar to a specific textual input. So this would be called modalities of data, textual versus imagerial. Uh, one of the things that we uh, learned to do, and this is also the foundation of, let's say, all the neural networks that OpenAI shares, in their case, the network is called CLIP, is a form of translating from one representation such as textual to imagerial, but unlike, let's say, the, the work that OpenAI does, in our case, we try to be more industry-oriented and more like application-oriented. So in the case of OpenAI and many of the purely academic publications and labs, what they are interested in is just like claiming a new, uh, better accuracy result on a, a specific- state of the art. Exactly. So no matter at what cost. So uh, they make neural networks oftentimes 10 times larger and bulkier, but the neural network itself is not is only gaining maybe like 0.1% in accuracy or something like that, abysmal improvement. Well, it is it is important in some cases. Uh, I don't want to diminish their work. It's also very relevant. But in our case, we want to make AI not just powerful, but also applicable to power the next million applications that will grow around us and transform the, the industries around us in the next decade. Yeah. So we try to make neural networks as close to state of the art in terms of accuracy as possible while still being smaller in size and broader in terms of their applicability. For reference, the classical clip model that OpenAI shared is not multilingual. So it's trained exclusively on English corpus so that people who do not know English will not be able to transform their textual inputs into imagerial results. In our case, uh, we try to build neural networks that are equally versed, and, and I want to stress this, they're not just familiar with different languages. We want them to be equally versed on a broad set of languages, which also involves a fair share of data engineering, data set collection, and so on. Because even the companies like OpenAI, when they train multilingual models, they take data sets that are ex exceptionally non-uniform in terms of the language representations. Right. So like Common Crawl, the most known data set, it's about 300 terabytes of pages from web. It contains over 50% of English, about 6.4% of Russian, and every other language is smaller and smaller. In our case, well, um, one of the reasons why the product for shared representations will be called uniform is because we have uniform distribution of languages in our data set. Right. So we learn Chinese, we learn Arabic, we learn English, we, we learn Spanish. Just like as a a person who's curious in everything, we try to make our neural right. networks equally interested in all the cultures around us. Yeah. You touched on something really important. Um, so a lot of machine learning research, the work that we see that's done at OpenAI, Google's AI Lab, FAIR, et cetera, 
is really just pushing the state of the art by you know this factor and a lot of those models i think some people might be surprised to find out never actually come to the market in any meaningful way they stay in the labs over the last few years though there's been sort of this kind of movement in the i guess you could call it like the ml ops community of sort of building not only tooling which it sounds like is some of what you guys are doing but also bringing machine learning into into products that people use and it's kind of echoes sort of what we saw in like the early 2000s, late 90s with the DevOps community being formed and developed. Like you have stuff like AWS that came about or Docker and even Git and stuff, right? Now we're seeing that with machine learning. How do you see this development from like traditional computing, traditional software engineering, I should say, towards ML first products uh, happening? How much of it is, is it a lack of sort of the tooling and, and things and things that like Unum is doing? Or is it more of just uh, people need to stop worrying about State of the art being pushed by you know one percent and just get on with building products. Well, that's one of those questions that yeah. I may not have an answer to because uh, you can never like look into the future and see how things will evolve. I think there's like a broader consensus in the industry that yes, there's this like ML ops industry forming that uh, helps with the data engineering, like yeah. all the tools that rise there. To be honest, projecting it in the into the future, uh, extrapolating the current tendencies given what happened like with the devops it makes me a bit sad because always when the adoption of the technology grows uh, the average level of competence of the people who apply the technology drops drops significantly same way as with databases and infrastructure software and low level and high performance computing so people uh, 40 years ago were much more comfortable with programming in assembly or like systems programming languages where you have um, uh, manual memory control and this kind of stuff now we use we're used to uh, technologies that are far higher level it makes easier for us to develop tools but oftentimes or like de develop product but oftentimes we make shortcuts that we don't even acknowledge yeah. so like most of the developers who i talk to even the relatively experienced ones when they use a high level language like python or even like javascript or even java they do not realize the cost of all the abstractions that they trigger without actually realizing what could have they gained if they've only stepped one layer down yeah yeah i mean like the person building a product using nlp today natural language processing will probably i mean this is an ex a bit of an extreme statement maybe but like very few people will build will actually build the models anymore. It's just going to be yes. API calls to open AIs, GPT, whatever that they'll be or working with. Or ours in the or future. Yours, yes. Of course. <laughs> or hugging face or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's a really good point. Like the core NLP knowledge will significantly decrease. Yes. But I guess that's it, that's the cost you pay for making the technology more readily available, right? Of course. I guess it makes sense. Yeah. So why are we now? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you could have built this in St. Petersburg or anywhere in the world, it seems like. So why'd you come here? Uh, well, that's always a hard question to answer. Uh, it's true that I had the opportunity to build it in other places as well, but I see long-term potential in Armenia. So when I came here, uh, people were trying to convince me internally that in many ways, this is like a technical hub uh, that has like the best engineers on the planet or something like this. I tend to disagree with this. I've seen a lot of really talented people, uh, like truly the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. And those are people that you can count like on the fingers of your two hands, like top 10, top 100 of best engineers in a specific domain. I'm not sure that in many, if any of those domains, there is a single person from Armenia. But what we have here is extreme density. So we may not have the absolute numbers because we have just like such a tiny country, but we have very high density of tech and we have a culture that can allow us to form, like to select a new industry around which our future will revolve. So this is similar to the shifts that had happened in Israel over the course of the last decades. I tend to think that Armenia can be the next Israel in this sense, in many ways, potentially even bigger than Israel and denser than Israel, if we get uh, our stuff together and I think this is actually happening regardless of like my involvement in it. So there's natural path of how it all goes. So first you have like outsourcing agencies, then you have like product companies, then there's deep talk emerging just like our company. And then you have like an entire industry. In the case of Armenia, if you have only like a couple million people in the country, if you'll have like 
five unicorns in the same place, uh, that would easily mean that technology is by far the biggest uh, driver of the economy. And we can define the mindset of the people who are just growing up right now, like younger kids, maybe like 10, 15 years old, uh, younger than us, to actually become those passionate developers who never stop, who would be the top 1% of the top 1% of the top 1% in 10 years. And uh, this is like the sad outlook that you always have to bear in mind that we may not have some things now, but we also have others, other things that other companies, uh, other countries don't have. And the general uh, statement that I gave here is that how many countries do you know that have not just a software industry, but also a hardware industry? Those are very few countries like this. So one of them would be Taiwan. Another one would be South Korea. Another one would be Israel. Mm -hmm. Now you have UK emerging as another one. And there is US. That's it. So Armenia is surprisingly in this list of countries. And this is a very good company to be in. Like all those countries are exceptionally developed, exceptionally wealthy, very democratic. Do um, you think there's enough hardware activity in Armenia to, to make us warrant us being on our way into that list? Uh, we're definitely coming there, if not already there. So to put some proof into my claims, at some point I was giving a talk at Synopsis HQ in uh, the Bay Area. And it was just there that I realized that one of the employees from there approached me telling me that there is a, a synopsis branch in Armenia, which kind of shocked me because back then I wasn't coming to Armenia. Uh, I didn't have much connection to the country, let alone an exact plan of how I'm building a company here. Then when I arrived, I realized that one, uh, the branch that synopsis manages in Armenia is one of the largest in the world. Second only to the U.S. and larger than the offices that the company has in India. And India is a country with about almost a thousand times more people. So if you assume it's a couple million people here in Armenia, it's 1.5 billion in India. So if you think that those uh, numbers aren't shocking, here are a couple more facts. So the first one, now Armenia is home to AMD, which happened through another acquisition. So first Xilinx came which was a great green flag for me because I knew the company. They, they're doing FPGAs, Field Programmable Gated Race. Great semiconductor company. And then last year, due to acquisition, they became part of AMD, Advanced Microsoft, uh, Micro Devices. AMD is one of the three largest chip giants being uh, in uh, their descending order of market caps, NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel. And guess what? Now NVIDIA also has a branch in Armenia, with a couple hundred engineers. And in addition to that, even the European companies such as Siemens now do a lot of their like chip design and verification activities in Armenia, which mm -hmm. is an amazing sign. And the industry is just about to take off with startups emerging uh, uh, like as a spin-offs of those companies. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see the startups that emerge because you're right. I mean, I think Synopsis employs close to a thousand people in Armenia, yeah. which is a huge number. And it's been in the country for... I want to say more than 16, 17 years now. So there's definitely a lot of talent that's been baked in the country. So I hope to see that sort of graduate into a hardware ecosystem. Ashut, one more thing I'm really curious about just before we wrap up. Uh, I'll give you two final questions. The first was earlier in our conversation, you said you went and asked your teacher, uh, what were three of the most complex problems you could be working on? Uh, if someone was to ask you that today, how would you answer it? What problems should you know young people be thinking about pursuing? Uh, so... Answering your question, there are a few problems that are really drive me personally. So like, I, I, if I don't see labs emerging in this space at faster pace, uh, once UNUM takes off, I will take on the duty of helping those industries grow in Armenia and outside. Okay. So obviously artificial intelligence is one because like I'm working on it day and night. Another one would be prolonging the, uh, the length of human life and probably more importantly, the quality. Uh, so I'm really interested in stem cell research. Uh, I'm very passionate about bioinformatics. Uh, I actually tried to enroll into a bioinformatics program uh, and failed again. Another thing that really um, plays well into this whole future industries story with like genetics and bioinformatics and all this is like metamaterials. 
So materials? yeah, so like designing materials that have properties unseen in modern uh, structures. And uh, you may ask like what meta material is. A meta material is like a structure that differs in like a su on a super molecular level. So not on the molecular level, but beyond it. So like how do you compose them like into a broader thing? So like this may include different custom foams. Mm -hmm. It may include carbon nanotubes that essentially like just pieces of carbon that you can form in different ways. Well, carbon is just like marvelous in this thing that like everything around us is made of it. And yet we still find new ways to actually gain uh, new properties out of it. So like, for example, electronics can be drastically changed if we find materials such as potentially the ones based on carbon that will have much higher electrical conductivity with like lower dissipation. So all of this will be coming out of metamaterial research. And with this, I want to emphasize for all the young kids who listen that there are universities where you can study all of it. And if you're choosing where to go and study next year, even if it's in Armenia, like there's the Yerevan State University, there's the Polytechnic University. If you're cho choosing between maybe less technical, potentially simpler subject so that you can just like go through the university without reading a single book or something like that, uh, which, if I'm honest, is what my brother pursued, then, okay, maybe this is not the path for you. But I would, again, advise you to reconsider. When you're young, your brain works in a different, mysterious way when you just catch everything that happens around you. Maybe you will still go through university. You may not learn physics. I, by the way, forgot almost all of it. Uh, but still, it teaches you to think in a much more structured way. Yeah. You also have the like gift of naivety when you're young, right? Yeah. <laughs> when, once you lose that, it's harder to yeah. pursue things that are that ambitious. You said uh, if we get our uh, stuff together, um, we'll be able to develop our ecosystem and have tech be the driving force of the economy. What does that look like? Can you be specific as to what you, what would it mean to look like to see us getting our stuff together? What do you see lacking? So I'm no policymaker. And where, when you are not one and when you're not doing something, this something always seems trivial to you. Like uh, it's only once you start implementing something that you realize all the complexity and that there is like actually a profession or a person working on this day and night and he cannot like implement it. So uh, I, I may have been a bit naive. We tried talking with some of the policymakers, even in Armenia, who may have similar values and may want to help. But the whole machinery of large structures such as governments may not be optimized for this. So, of course, if that was like a magic wand, I would have just requested that all the bureaucratic procedures would have been lifted and we would have like more flexibility in the work that we do. So uh, Specifically at UNUM or in the ecosystem generally? In the ecosystem in general, but some problems I see in our case more pronounced than in some other companies. So for one, when I came here, I didn't realize like how people buy electronics here. And like when you're in a small country, it's always a question of like having complex imports. That's actually the beauty of having larger unions like the European Union when they have shared treaties for like the import and the export stuff. So everyone in the country can buy the newest equipment. And if we want to be like a tech first nation, how can we work on laptops that are like five, 10 years old? So uh, when I asked other entrepreneurs like what they do, how they equip their engineers, sometimes I would hear answers like when just when we go outside, we buy a laptop in a store and we bring it with us. And this didn't make sense in my brain because I grew up in a very large country and lived in a few others where the similar procedures are in place when there's actually a, a standardized import channel for everything new that happens in the world. In here, we go through a complex mass of imports every time we want to bring something cool. And at this point, for example, there is a cable, a cable that is on the customs for the last three months that we need for our servers. We, we needed them actually like half a year ago, but it took time like to connect with the manufacturers because the kind of hardware that we buy for this deep tech stuff, the next level technologies, it's very advanced. Like many con countries will not even be allowed to import this technology or like to be more precise, the companies that produce it oftentimes do not export it to different places. So bringing it to Armenia is really complex thing. And we invest our own money, our own savings to bring this here. And when uh, like international delivery takes, let's say one week 
and then it's another 12 weeks of waiting for the customs. It's an obvious example of bad policies, yes. And we cannot even address the issues directly because we need to hire brokers. And for every like uh, cable that we import, if it's, let's say it's optics, so it's a glass fiber inside. Because it's a glass fiber, we need approvals from three different ministries. And only a brokerage company can sign and actually bring in the items. So the company that orders cannot do it themselves. You have to rely on a ton of different uh, suppliers. Yeah. And Ashut, uh, my last question. Where do you hope to see Unum in the next five to 10 years? What will you, what will you guys be working on in a decade? So that's a great question. Uh, Research-wise, uh, my passion has been and will be uh, in artificial intelligence and more specifically neurosymbolic computing. So uh, those would be uh, the kinds of models that do not exist today. This is a bridge between uh, the products of the work and like the, the results of the second AI summer and the th third AI summer. So the second AI summer is the 80s when people designed mostly Lisp-based systems that work on uh, large symbol-based programs, like manipulating the stuff uh, with rules. And the modern approach is purely statistical, uh, mostly throwing a lot more compute onto the problem and loosening up the rules. So it's more probabilistic. I and many other researchers, both uh, inside and outside, believe that the future is somewhere in between. We just need to find ways to bridge those two worlds together. And this is like the research side. Business-wise, I generally, I'm generally rarely wrong in terms of like the quality of product or research or business size or something like that but i'm always almost always wrong on time so like i always underestimate how much it will take uh, to design something and i guess it's pretty normal if you're designing stuff that no has never been done before right with this kind of technology if we manage to grow it into a proper company looking at our competitors like uh, even tiny ones like mongodb with 30 billion valuation they manage to earn over $500 million a year. I would consider it my personal failure as uh, an entrepreneur and uh, a person potentially, if I cannot grow our company to the same numbers, $500 million ARR uh, in five to 10 years. Wow, okay. I wish you a lot of luck with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being here. This is really fascinating and I hope we'll be able to do it again. Thank you, Ashut. Thank you very much. It's one of the nicest conversations I've had and I'm happy to repeat <laughs> at any time. Awesome. Happy, happy to hear that. <laughs>